And make a morning church. And happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Go ahead and raise your hand if you're a father in the building this morning. Come on, daddies. Amen. Oh, look, Michael is so special. He got him a little balloon and, and some flowers. Okay, okay. Amen. I hope I get some flowers in, in, in a balloon on my first Father's Day, man. <laughs> Amen, family. Well, happy Father's Day. Super grateful to be in the house of God this morning to worship with you. You know, uh, you know I was thinking, I was like, man, this is actually like my first Father's Day lesson. And then for those of you guys that know, I'm not a father. Amen. Uh, I mean, I, I, some of you might say that I am just because I have a cat named Simba, you know. So, I mean, maybe that might count just a little bit. But, uh, you know, Michael told me in the pre-meeting this morning, he said, hey, soon and very soon, you will be a father. Amen. And I definitely look forward to that, uh, to that day of being a father. But, you know, you know, Father's Day... Father's Day for some of us can be, you know, a very special time, um, and for some of us it can be a really challenging time. And we all know that, you know, we all grow from different backgrounds and, and we've, we've had different situations and whatnot, but it's always good to go back to the scriptures to really see what a godly father looks like. You know, Psalms 18 verse 30, it says, as for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. Does that not sound like a father right there, does it? But it shows that God is perfect. Now, I don't know what kind of father you grew up with, bad or good. We know that God is the perfect father. Because we know as fathers, people mess up. People are sinful, right? So we don't have perfect fathers in, 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 in this world. But the Bible reassures us that God is perfect, and he is a perfect father. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. I just want to look at a couple of scriptures that demonstrate what God is to us as a father. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, in verse 3, the Bible reads, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just is he. Now that's the kind of father that I love right here through the passages. Because it says that God is faithful. God is upright. God is just, and there is no wrong in him. That encourages me because it helps me to know, like, man, when I become a father... I'm going into this knowing I'm going to make many mistakes. But God is going to help me to cover up those mistakes because of his awesomeness. Amen. But today I want to remind us of what we have in God this morning. I want to remind us how the Bible shows God is in, is in our life. And so the title of my lesson today is simply, Do You Know What You Have in God? Do you know what you have in God? Point number one, God is Abba. God is Abba. Be turning with me to Mark chapter 14. You know, this morning I want to look at how the Bible calls God who he is from the scriptures. You know, there's three places in the Bible that this word Abba is used, and it's an Aramaic term. And it's referenced in Galatians 4, 6, Romans 18, verse 15, and Mark 14, 36, in which we're going to look at. But these are the three places in the Bible that the word Abba is used in reference to God. Now, let's take a look at Mark 14, verse 36. It says, then he left the crowd and went into the house. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in Matthew chapter 13. Sorry about that. Mark, Matthew, they kind of look the same, amen? Um, Mark chapter 14, sorry, let me get there. You know, when you, when you read the scripture and you're like, that is not the scripture that I had in my lesson right there. Mark 14, verse 36. This is where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. 
Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And, you know, we've read this passage multiple times in which we see the heartache that Jesus is going through. We see that Jesus is in the most vulnerable state of his life being on earth. And yet he goes and he, he, he drops to his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, Abba, Father. Now again, the word Abba, th- this is reference to an intimate relationship with God. And it shows the character of God being a loving father. But what I love about this is that it shows that even though this was one of the most vulnerable times of Jesus' life, you see the vulnerable or how vulnerable he is in his relationship with God. That he's crying out to God. He's saying, God, I don't want to do this. I don't like this. It's going to be painful. It's going to be challenging. Please take this cup from me. Why? Because he knew that if there was anybody in the universe that could do it, it was his father. It was his Abba. But, you know, this term also describes the fatherly love of a father in which shows that this God knows you so well. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. And he's able to to tell you what it is that you need in your life. Though you don't want him to tell you what you need in your life. Abba, the Father, created each and every one of us with different personalities. He's knitted us in the way that he wanted us to be knitted. And so it shows the intimacy that we can have in this relationship with God. But, you know, one of the biggest things that I love about being able to call God Abba is that that makes me a child of God. That, that makes you a daughter of God, a son of God. And there's this, this false doctrine that tends to go around quite a bit where people say, you know, God, everyone that is on this earth, those are God's children. That is not true. Now, God created them, and those are his creation. But the Bible would say otherwise. Let's take a look at John chapter 1. I, I, I just want to show you biblically What you have in God this morning. In John chapter 12, or John chapter 1, verse 12. In verse 12, this is where the apostle John describes the divinity of Jesus and how he is God in the flesh. And in verse 12, we'll pick it up. It says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. Isn't that awesome? So the the, the scripture is very plain. It shows that, hey, if you are a Christian, if you are a disciple, if you believe Jesus is Lord and that he is the way and he is the truth and he is the life, what does that make everybody else? Not a son, not a daughter of God, if they do not believe that. So that's encouraging because all of us, I believe, believe this right here, do we not? And because we believe in this, we have the privileges of a child of God. You know, one of the, the, the memes, you know, memes are very popular nowadays, right? Now, I don't know if you guys ever seen this meme, but it's this picture of this guy in this, this uh, I think like a bus tenant or a, a train tenant who checks the tickets to see, you know, what kind of tickets you have and, you know, if you paid so that you can, you know, get on the bus and whatnot. And it's funny because I wish I could show you the picture. I have it in my notes right here. This is the funny picture. And it says, the attendant looks at the guy and he says, why do you have a child's ticket? And the guy's like really confused looking at the attendant. And he says, because I'm a child of God. You know, and, and, but with confidence, he's just like confused that you would even ask me that question. Why I have a child's ticket? Because I'm a child of God. And when I thought of that, I could not help but think, man, that is the confidence that we should have as children. That we, we, we walk out with our chest out. We, we go out and we say, I, I dare you to mess with me because I'm a child of God. Okay. That God got my back. God's going to provide for me. 
And, and, and that's the confidence that we need to have as disciples of, of, of children of God. Amen? Because we know God is going to come through. He's going to listen to you. And that he gives great miracles to you in your life. Those are the privileges of being a child of God. You know, I want to kind of list a couple things just to remind us of some of these privileges. Because I believe that at times we can forget what you have in God as your Abba. Amen. You know, because you're a child of God, your inheritance never perishes. You get to go to heaven. I, I think that's a, a good take right there. Amen. You get protection. You know, when I thought of this, I thought, you know, the, the brother or the sister that, you know, picks at you or kind of gets on your nerves or even hurts you at times, even sometimes purposefully. And, and, and you, wanna, you want justice for that brother or sister. But I always think of growing up with my siblings, you know, you're, you, you get hurt by them. And you, what do you do? You run to mom or you run to dad and you tattletale. Mom, dad, so-and-so's picking on me. They hit me. They said this about me. And in, in the same way, you know, dad gets up there and says, if you keep it up, I'm going to give you a whipping. And so you feel, you look and you're just looking at, looking at your sibling like, you going to get a whipping, you going to get a whipping, keep messing with me. You see, God's going to have your back. So don't worry about the brother or the sister that, that you feel stabs you in the back. Don't worry about the brother or sister that you feel like doesn't love you. God got something for them, amen? Because he will protect you. You know, I think of that, I'm like, man, non-Christians better be careful when they say something to me because I'm a child of God. Okay. I don't, you, I'm just, let me just warn you right now, just to let you know, I am highly favored and protected by my Abba, by my God. And because of that, I'm, I just want to let people know so that way God don't, you know, put them in a the hospital or, you know, he might, I don't know what God's going to do. God don't like ugly. I just, I don't want to even imagine what God would do if someone messes with me. You know what I'm saying? So we have to understand that we are protected by God. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 19, it says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You know, I love this passage because it describes how we can now become intimate with God through the blood of Jesus. Wow. And it's interesting because back in the day, you know, for the priests to come in and for the Day of Atonement, there was fear there. All the priests were fearful when they would walk in to make sure that, hey, if I, if I mess up in any kind of way, God will strike me dead where I stand. And the scripture entails and it shows us that we can walk in the presence of God without fear. That many of us, before we became a child of God, before we became a son, before we became a daughter, you were an enemy of God. Wow. And because you're an enemy of God, now that you have come into this relationship with him, you don't have to fear. But it shows in verse 19, it says, therefore, brothers, since we have this confidence, other versions say, says boldness. The Bible says that we can approach God with boldness. Yeah. You see, there's certain things that you can ask your dad in boldness that, she, that no one else can do right there, amen? And God expects that from us. But it also says in verse 22, to let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance yeah, yeah. of faith. On, you know, we can walk in God's presence knowing that we are dearly loved. We can walk in God's presence knowing that he just wants us to draw near to him with a sincere heart, with full assurance of faith that we trust him with our very being. And it allows us to understand that no matter what you're going through, you can just get up, 
crawl up on God's lap and sit there, cry, and he will just wrap your arms around you, hug you, sing to you, and just rock you back and forth till you feel comforted. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God we have in a father. Amen? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, we'll pick it up in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his sons ask for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will, will he give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give God, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You know, I'm inspired by this passage because another privilege that we are able to receive from God is he is just on on the speed dial. You can call him up at any time. You know, you can't bug God. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, sometimes people call you a lot and you, and you feel bugged a little bit. You're like, man, this brother and sister be bugging me. Like, can I just chill? That's not God. God is just like, hello, hello, what you need? I'm here. I'm doing this for you. Which, what, 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 you see the future that I have for you? You know the plans that I have for you? I'm ready. I'm here. I'm available. But, you know, the scripture also talks about how you know, we know how to give good gifts, do we not? I hope we do, amen. Some of us are terrible at it. But praise God. But God shows that, man, I give good gifts. That's another great prayer. I, I don't know about you, but I love receiving gifts. If you ever want to encourage me, just give me, give me a gift, and I'll, be, I'll feel super loved because it's thoughtful. You know, it means a lot. You know, God gives great, incredible gifts. And I want us to reflect. I want us to think about all the great gifts God has given given to you up until this point. You know, the question that I have for us this morning is, do you feel spoiled by God? Because God is a perfect father. He is an awesome father. He gives you great things. But sometimes we get ungrateful. You see, the reason why... You, you, you start to struggle and you don't, and you don't start seeing God as your father. Or you feel like there's just nothing going on right in your life. It's because you have forgotten that you are spoiled by God. That's a privilege. Do you feel privileged this morning that you are spoiled by God? But now looking at how God is our Abba and God is our father and all the privileges that we receive as a child of God... I want to now look at how God is known as El Roy. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. You know, the description of El Roy means the God who sees. You know, God sees all your misery. He sees all your hurts. He sees all your failures. He sees all your desires. And yet he's full of goodness and mercy who chases after you. You know, the name El Roy means that God always is watching over your affairs. He's always watching to see what does my child need at this very moment. You know, he sees when you need to get discipled. He sees when you need that TLC, that tender love and care. And ultimately, he sees what you want in life, and he wants to be quick to fulfill that. But let's look at an example right here where this is actually the only part of the Bible in which God is referred to, El Roy. Genesis chapter 16, we'll pick it up in verse 6. So this is where, you know, Hagar is having a tough time. And, you know, Sarah, because she she couldn't bear children and, and, and give children to Abraham, she gives Abraham her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar. And so because she gives her um, Hagar, 
she ends up kind of, in a sense, becoming resentful because she's able to bear kids for Abraham, and she isn't. And so she starts to mistreat Hagar, and it forces Hagar to run away from uh, Abram and Sarah. We'll pick it up in verse 6. It says, your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now a child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Ber Lai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. You know, I love this because it shows that God saw Hagar's misery. And as Hagar was struggling, as she fled into the wilderness with no food, with no water, God sends an angel to her and gives her a promise that, hey, you will bear a child and I will take care of you. But I want you to go back to Sarah, who is mistreating you. And it's interesting because you look at Hagar and you see that she probably felt alone. She probably felt so many emotions. And she probably felt like, man, I, I've been given the wrong card right here. All I have been doing is serving for my whole life. I've done nothing wrong, and yet I'm being mistreated, and I'm probably going to die in the desert. But God knew what she needed. You know, she thought her circumstance needed transformation, but ultimately it was her that needed the transformation with her heart. God knew that it wasn't her circumstance that was going to change it, but it was going to be him putting her in the circumstance that would change it. And in verse 13 is the first time that she says, you are the God who sees me. You know, I want to encourage us this morning that God sees where you're at this morning. God knows what you need. And some, some of us might be feeling like, man, I, I, I'm in a difficult circumstance, but it's okay. God sees. You know, you may be feeling the pressure of the ministry, but God sees. You know, you might even be running away from God right now, but God sees. But what I love about God and, and, and how the Bible says that he is a God who sees is that he is always looking for ways to strengthen you. And that's exactly what he does to Hagar is that he looked for a way to strengthen her faith. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. You know, when I think about how God is always looking for ways to strengthen us, I can't help but think of a couple examples of, of my own father. You know, and, and, and I've had a rough past with my dad, and my dad is awesome. He's an incredible guy, and, and honestly, I wouldn't be the man I am if it wasn't for my father. But some of the great memories that I have with my dad is I remember him working like 12, 13-hour shifts and coming home and doing Hooked on Phonics with me. In elementary, you know, I wasn't the best reader, and, you know, I, I, needed, I needed help. And I, back in the day, it, was, it wasn't called, what is it called? They have all kinds of programs today, like such what, Sylvan. Um, but back then, it was called Hooked on Phonics. So I remember this big old white box, and it had all the lessons and all the recordings. And every day, my dad would sit me down in, the, in his office, and he would help me to, to get better at reading. Um, and, and it's one of the memories that I cherish the most because I saw how hard my dad worked, but then I also saw how hard he was working to strengthen me in an area in which I was weak in. And I, I just remember... You know, those times, and even go, get, getting into high school, he looked for a program called AVID, which is a, a program that really helps students in high school to get into college and to get accepted to four years. And I, again, I'm, I'm an eighth grader, so I know nothing. And, and here's my dad looking for a way to get me in. He had to fight for me to get into this program. But I looked, and I was like, man, he always was trying to strengthen 
my, my abilities and my education so that I can advance in my life and that I can have something that he never had. And I look and I'm like, man, he was always looking for ways to build me up and to strengthen me. And that is the same way God is to us. God is, you know, you're, you're in a, a tough situation and God's just like, I'm using that to strengthen you because you're weak in this area and I want you to get strong. But then we're so quick to, to cop an attitude at God. Like we, we, we were so quick to be, to be so, you know, pointing fingers and blaming people and saying like, it's all your fault. It's all your fault, God, why I'm going through this. No, he has you there for a specific reason. Amen. And in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, this describes God's heart. He says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And when I, I think, I'm like, man, God, thank you so much. Thank you for just looking for ways to strengthen me. But you know there's a catch to the strengthening part. What, what does it say right there? He's looking for those who are, our hearts are fully committed. Is there any uncommitment in your life this morning in your relationship with God? I want to challenge us, get committed. Get committed to your father so that you can actually see what he's trying to allow you to grow in. Amen? Point number three, God is Jehovah Jireh. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, this is one of the first areas in which God is also mentioned as Jehovah Jireh. And in Jehovah Jireh, you know, it, it means the Lord will provide. And actually, you know, we're, we're, for time's sake, we're not going to read this. We'll go, we'll actually turn to Hebrews 11. But I, I just want to reference this real quick. Because Genesis 22 is described where, you know, God calls Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac, right? And, and the Bible isn't clear at how Abraham was feeling or how Isaac was feeling it just showed a trust in both of them when it came to God. But I want to show you what the New Testament shows about Abraham's faith when it came to understanding God's character and being Jehovah Jireh. Turn with me to Hebrews 11. I'm sorry for making you guys go to Genesis. But sometimes the spirit just changes, amen? You got, you got, you got to go where the spirit is leading you, amen? Don't resist the spirit. In Hebrews chapter 11... Verse 19, it says, Abraham reasoned that God, actually we're starting in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. You know, this gives us a great insight into Genesis 22 on how Abraham was so assured of God providing whatever it was, whether it be a sacrifice or that, hey, okay, God, I'm going to kill my son, but I have faith that you're going to resurrect him because of the promises. Yeah, because God told Abraham what he was going to do through his son Isaac specifically. So when, when, when Abraham heard that, he went up to that mountain with assurance that, hey, I don't know what's going to happen, but my God will provide. Amen. But check this out. This is really awesome because the word provide in our English vernacular, it doesn't, it doesn't do the word justice right here in the Bible. So the word provide in Hebrew actually means to see to it. But it also means to perceive and to experience. So when, when, when Abraham says, hey, God, you are Jehovah Jireh, Jireh, he's not saying, hey, God, you know, you're the one who just gives us the goods. He's actually saying that, hey, you see it. You experience all my needs, and therefore you will provide the provisions right there. And when I read that, I was so inspired by that. To know that it was, it, it's a deeper understanding that God is just going to be like, oh, you need this? Okay, here you go. Oh, okay, you need this in your bank account? Okay, here you go. No, he sees your situation. He, 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 he experiences it with you, and then he provides what is necessary in your life. You know, some of the things that God provides us is salvation. He provides us peace. 
He provides us with refreshment, with purpose. And I think sometimes when God doesn't provide the way that we want him to, we start to get faithless. We start to lose the trust in God. But we got to make sure that we, we, we don't get our wants mixed up with our needs. You know what I'm saying? Like, God says he will give you what you need. Don't forget that. And sometimes we, we, we just want, 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 and want, and then we get upset with God because it's not how we want it to turn out. And so, guys, I want to I encourage us this morning to know that God has your best interests, that he sees what you need, and he's a God of perfect timing. Amen? Amen. Let's close out with Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, we'll pick it up in verse 8. The Bible reads, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were so sinners, Christ died for us. And I want to remind us that you don't need to earn God's love. I think many of us have, have probably grown up trying to earn people's love, but also our father's love. You know, there's been times that, you know, growing up that I, I, I try to do great in school, you know, to earn my dad's love. There was times where I, I, I wanted to achieve in my athletics to earn my dad's love. But when you try to earn someone's love, it's never enough. And... When I look at this passage, I'm like, well, even before I was a disciple, God died for me so that I can receive his love and know that I didn't have to earn it. And I look and I'm like, you know, God sees how much you love him. And I, I want us to have a conviction this morning that though you don't have to earn God's love, you definitely need to show how much you love God. And I, to be honest, you know, as I think of Father's Day and I think of my future and I think of, you know, what I went through in my childhood, I'm like, man, I, I want to be a great dad. And to be honest, there, there's fear in my heart when it comes to being a father because I'm like, am I going to make the same mistakes that I saw growing up? Am, am I going to make my child feel a certain way? Am, am I going to be able to love my child enough? Like there's all these like irrational fears that I can have. But what, I, what I've learned in just really studying out God's names in, this, in these areas is that, man, if, if I remember that God is my Abba, if that he is my El Roy, and that he's my, jo my, jo my Jehovah Jireh, I can't go wrong. I have incredible examples in the scriptures to show me what a godly father looks like. I have incredible men in the God's kingdom who are fathers, who can guide me, who can disciple me and teach me how to be a great dad. And I have everything that I need. I have all the tools, like Michael said, to break those generational curses when it comes to not having our fathers. And so, guys, I want us to remember what you have this morning in God. So however you're feeling this morning, I hope you're encouraged. Because you were able to see the privileges. You were able to see what God is doing in your life and how he ultimately wants to take care of you. So, guys, let's have a great Father's Day. Let's honor our God and let's give him glory. Amen. To God be the glory.